Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Online health insurance shopping is closer to reality and state-funded all-day kindergarten could soon be an option. The latest on each of these issues in this week's Capital Report. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in. I'm Julie Barkey with this week's Capital Report. We shop for a variety of items online, clothing, plane tickets, and soon health insurance could be on that list. Exchange legislation is moving through the committee process and members have until March 31st to pass the insurance marketplace proposal or Minnesota will be rolled into the federal exchange. There is something for everyone to love in this bill. Even you, Senator Thompson, I believe. Um, there, there is something in here for everyone to hate as well. And, and I understand that. And this is a, this, it makes it a very difficult conversation to approach, but it's an important one for the state of Minnesota. And so I have been working with many stakeholders and have given on some issues that are of particular importance, and I will address those as I get to the bill. This is just a cornerstone of what we can use as um, the, the foundation for true and meaningful health care reform for our people. And so it's important that we do it right, but it's only one piece, and I always ne think that we need to uh, make that point as we move forward. A couple of the things that will help us move forward well with this, um, April mentioned uh, this will serve 1.3 Minnesota uh, million uh, Minnesotans. It's estimated that 300,000 of those are currently uninsured that will be finding insurance products to cover their needs. And that's a huge step forward for Minnesota and our consumers. We oppose what's being <coughs> created, and but we wanted you to understand, because people have said, well, what is the exchange? Well, see, it's not really the board. It's really this huge IT infrastructure that will be under control of this board that's going to meet quarterly, which I think is kind of amusing. And uh, although I know it can uh, meet more, but you know, it's 50, 60 million dollars and 70 some employees. So this is a really big deal, but the really big deal is to understand that it is the largest data sharing system in the, hi in the history of this country, and it will be the largest data sharing system in the history of this state. Here to talk about the health insurance exchange is the author from the House, Representative Joe Atkins. Thanks for joining, uh, joining us today. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. So let's begin with the exchange. You know, it isn't really a partisan issue per se. It was an idea that Governor Tim Pawlenty had introduced years ago. But many in the GOP still consider it the wrong direction for Minnesota. Why do you think it's the right direction? Well, and actually, in, in the House, it is a bipartisan bill. We have myself, Representative Abler, Representative Davids, uh, Republicans and Democrats as authors of the bill. Uh, and uh, I don't, some, some perceive it, I, I gather, as a partisan issue. But the bottom line is if we don't pass our own Minnesota grown version of a health exchange, the feds are going to do it for us, or as some might say, do it to us. And then we would have a federal exchange. And I don't think anybody wants to have a federal plan. And that seems to be the crux of the opponent. When, when somebody's opposed to it, they're, they're not a fan of it being essentially a mandate from the federal government. Do it or you'll be rolled into ours. So how do you get people like that on board and well, to work with you? And you know what? I'm not a fan of it being a mandate either. But the fact is, it is. It's federal law. And if we don't do it, then the federal government is going to do it to us. And they're going to do it at a much higher price. Uh, their expenses would be a third um, by their own definition would be a 30, 35, 37 percent higher than what we're proposing in Minnesota. Let's talk a little bit about just the idea of being able to shop for your insurance online. People do it with their vehicles, they do it, you know, they buy a lot of different items online. How is this going to be different? Well, and by the way, I think we did most of our Christmas shopping online. Um, every day that I came home, my wife had a package arriving, and it's a, it's a neat way to shop. The fact is, though, health insurance, it might be a simpler process online, but it's still a complex project or product. And so you want to you wanna make sure that you've got a good platform, an understandable one that people can work their way through. It's not going to be the kind of thing where you sit down, for example, people compare it to, uh, to kayak or whatever where you can buy a plane ticket. I can do that in 10 minutes. You're not going to select, at least I hope you're not going to select your health insurance uh, in 10 minutes. It might take, you know, an hour or something like that of kind of intense study and comparing apples to apples products, uh, but it's a great, uh, a great place to be able to shop. So do you consider that part of your priority then as a legislator to try to make it a little more um, easy or to make it easier to navigate for the general public as this comes into fruition? I think the, the purpose is twofold. One is to have it be convenient and easy for people to shop for. The second, though, is to really have it be that apples to apples uh, comparison 
where you right now, you know, I've got a little law firm in South St. Paul. We've got eight employees. We don't have any leverage at all, or at least we don't feel like we do. When we go shopping for health insurance, we feel captive um, to the market and that we really don't get much of a good deal. Uh, by virtue of having literally online right before you different uh, different possible plans for your business, uh, for, your, uh, for your individual family, uh, we think that that's going to make for a more competitive market. Let's talk a little bit about some of the concerns with this legislation. One that was brought up by Senator Michelle Benson, and we talked to her a bit later in the program. She talks about the lack of any data privacy provision, the way the bill is currently written. Is this a valid concern? Yes. Um, and we need data privacy, uh, and it will be and is in reflected in the House version of the bill. And I expect by the time it gets through the seven committees in the Senate and the seven committees in the House, there will be ample data practice and data privacy uh, protections. Another criticism brought up in different committees is that insurance rates are going to rise. In your opinion, is this going to happen? Is this an absolute? Uh, you know what? When you have a good, vibrant, uh, competitive market, prices tend to go down, not up. Okay. You have until March 31st to pass this exchange legislation. Would you be comfortable if it's passed as it's currently written, or do you think there's a lot of refining that still needs to happen? You know, I actually, I value the, the legislative process, the public hearings, the committee, the legislator input, the input from stakeholders. I'm hoping it'll just become a, a better, improved, uh, uh, more practical product by the time we're done. For those who are not tech savvy, because a lot of that is what this is based on. How, how would you recommend and what would you say to those people right now to maybe calm their fears or to help guide them through this process? You know what, that is such a good question because there, there is built into this bill uh, for, for folks that need in-person assistance, there's that. For folks that want to have a, a, a traditional health insurance agent or broker continue to help them, that's built into it. For folks that want to try it on their own and want to go to the public library, um, they should be able to access it there. There should be also other uh, opportunities, other places where they can access and just get online if they want to do it individually. But there's every conceivable option should be available to people when, this, uh, when it's up and running. And the bottom line is when this is all said and done, do you think the Minnesota exchange will be better, for lack of a better word, than the federal? Oh, without a doubt. It's going to be the best in the country. It's Minnesota grown. Um, we will, I have no doubt that when you can, pr let's take the worst case scenario, which is you have a complaint. Uh, you have a problem. Would you rather call a 651 area code and talk to somebody in Minnesota or a 202 area code and talk to somebody in Washington, D.C.? I think that answer is simple, and that is we'd want to talk to somebody here. That's when you have a problem. Otherwise, you know, working with uh, local agents, local brokers, uh, doing, uh, doing everything here locally and having Minnesota's Commissioner of Commerce and Commerce Department there for oversight, all of that is going to make it a, uh, a better product. One final point, and that is Minnesota has the best health care system in the country. Other states look to us to see how we do it. In fact, a lot of states are looking to see how we're doing this exchange, uh, this marketplace. Uh, and I don't want to give up that, uh, that big advantage that a lot of people have built up over many years. Well, some people are concerned that this might drag down Minnesota's reputation in that area. Do you think that this could, could, that could happen, or do you think it's actually going to build it up? Oh, shoot, if we do it right, it should enhance our reputation. I suspect that we are, not suspect, I know that there's many other states across the country looking to see how we do it, because however Minnesota does it is how other states want to do it. Uh, and most of them are saying the same thing. They don't want to have the federal government at a higher cost do it to them. And of course, Representative Adkins, we will track the legislation as it makes it through the process. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. In the first week of session, the Senate DFL rolled out several proposals, including increasing minimum wage by 25 cents per hour, expanding sales tax to clothing while lowering the overall rate, and requiring a supermajority vote to pass constitutional amendment proposals. Some bills have already had hearings, and the proposal to expand the sales tax garnered much debate in the Senate Tax Reform Committee. Instead of looking at raising the rates in the income tax system, we could possibly look at lowering the rates uh, if we had um, a, broader, a broader base. Does it create winners and losers? Um, that always comes with a reform of, of some kind, and you can't always hold every single item or uh, interest uh, within the state harmless in order to do that. As a person who marketed Mall of America for almost 24 years, I've been on the front lines of driving people to Minnesota, drawing people to Minnesota, and I really do understand what attracts people to this state. When people are deciding to come to Minnesota, um, the fact that we don't have sales tax on apparel is one of the top three decisions. Uh, uh, 
uh, top three factors in making their decision. And these tourists that come from outside Minnesota to shop in Minnesota are a huge impact on our state. Our tourism industry is a $12 billion industry in this state. It has that much economic impact on the state. 240,000 jobs are associated with tourism. And if we, if we add this tax on apparel, it will absolutely affect our tourism trade. I would also like some information on um, the um, uh, gross sales that are done at the Mall of America that are currently subject to um, uh, the sales tax that under my bill would get some relief. Uh, would go from six and a half to six percent on those items that are currently uh, taxed and um, uh, we know that there, there's more than just clothing <laughs> in the, at the Mall of America, a wide variety of, um, uh, of goods and services. I think it's great that we're bringing so many people to Minnesota mm -hmm. for transactions here in, the Minnesota, in Minnesota that are taxable and bringing in revenue. Um, I, I'm not sure why we would want to jeopardize that at all. And so I agree with your position completely. The health insurance exchange proposal is one that still has some strong opposition. Senator Michelle Benson sat down with us to talk about the issue and others as well. So Senator, um, why don't we begin with this health insurance exchange. It isn't necessarily a partisan issue. It was an idea that was formed by Governor Tim Pawlenty a few years ago, but many in the GOP, including you, believe it's the wrong direction for health care. Why? Well, Governor Pawlenty did have an exchange. And there are a lot of us who like the idea of the insurance marketplace being able to be found in one place, answer some questions, get some guidance, maybe find a broker who can help you make good decisions for your family. So it's not the idea of a marketplace that's the problem. For me, the problem is Washington dictating to us what that marketplace should look like. All of the data that's in the exchange actually resides in Washington and is part of a Washington-based database. The Commissioner of Human Services has the authority to make rules whenever she wants that would impact our exchange. So it's not really a Minnesota exchange. It's the Minnesota face of a Washington exchange. And my first responsibility as a legislator is to defend Minnesota and its citizens. Given that Minnesota is moving forward with exchange legislation, as a minority member of the HHS committee, are there different components that maybe you feel strongly should be included that aren't and how, how do you navigate your role in the minority party now to try to make sure that your voice is heard as this legislation does move forward? Well if the governor and the DFL on the House and Senate want this to be a bipartisan bill then they're going to have to look for protecting Minnesota's marketplace and there is some really strong bipartisan support for some particular provisions that are being um, damaged, threatened by the ACA. Minnesota Care, for example, uh, the Commissioner of Human Services, I'm sorry, Lucinda Justin, the Commissioner of Human Services, went to Washington to try to advocate for Minnesota Care to be able to stand on its own and not have to be rolled into the exchange until we're ready to make that move. Um, MSHA, our high risk pool, will be wiped out by the Washington high risk pool, but Minnesota will receive very little benefit because we're already doing a good job taking care of our uninsured or our hard to insure population. And so there is bipartisan support for protecting what is Minnesotan. Some of the biggest areas of controversy in the exchange bill, um, no Minnesota data privacy statutes apply in the bill as it's drafted. I have big concern for the citizens of the state, and there are many on the left and the right um, I believe Phyllis Kahn is a very strong advocate for data privacy. So we can find bipartisan support to change the data privacy requirements. The board has very broad rulemaking authority and is a, in fact exempt to the point where their rules would have the force of law, just like the legislature, without the necessity of a public hearing. And so we have a few really big roadblocks before I think any uh, Republican is going to look at this seriously and say it's good for Minnesota. Okay, Senator Benson, let's move on to state-funded all-day kindergarten. Again, not necessarily a partisan issue. Where do you stand on it? Um, and I haven't seen the legislation. I have a big concern for having kids out of parents' homes 
at an earlier and earlier age. I think there is something important about the, the parent-child bonding experience, especially in those early years. I believe, and it happens in my home, that we are the primary teachers of our children. And so helping to keep that responsibility in the home is important to me. That being said, I put my children in Montessori care at age three for a few hours a day because I thought that was an important developmental step for them as well. So I understand we need to strike a balance. I think for high risk populations, those mothers um, who maybe are single moms who are marginally educated, who are struggling, maybe the better, safer place for the most at risk children is to have them in an all day kindergarten situation where they are encouraged to learn and where some of the family dynamics can be helped and supported. So you're open to the idea? I'm open to it, but I wouldn't advocate it as a broad brush policy for every family in the state of Minnesota. And I'm afraid with funding uh, from the state, it then becomes almost a dictation to the districts and to the families saying we're missing this opportunity because we're making a choice to keep our children at home. And I'd like to get your impression of a few early pieces of legislation that have been introduced in the Senate already. One being including incre or inc increasing minimum wage by 25 cents an hour, expanding sales tax to clothing, requiring a supermajority vote to pass constitutional amendment proposals. So just a few of the ideas that have been introduced thus far. What is your impression of the tone of the legislation? Um, I think the DFL has decided to put their foot on the gas and go as fast as they can to move the agenda that they campaigned on. Um, there are some very powerful groups on the left who helped move these legislators into the majority and they're expecting some bills to be dropped and heard and voted on and probably turned into law. Um, so we have a long filtering process here at the legislature. I hope that uh, the Democrats will allow us some bipartisan participation. There are some things that I am flatly opposed to. Um, increasing the minimum wage has shown over and over and over again to actually cr increase unemployment in the marginally educated, in those who don't have work experience. They are the people we should be encouraging to move into the workforce. A possible modification is that if you're under 18, the old minimum wage stays in place. Um, so that teenagers have the opportunity to work, um, but employers don't have the burden of taking someone who has very little work experience and training them and getting them productive at a higher cost. What about the expansion of sales tax in committee for the Amazon portion of it, to use the term that's being bantered around in committee for the online sales? Even Senator Dave Thompson agreed that the idea is, is a good one. It just needs to be approached correctly. Would you agree with that or you do, do you hold true to the no increasing of, of taxes? I <clears throat> don't mind the expansion of internet sales tax per se. My concern is they're looking for more revenue. And so if we're going to do reform, let's freeze the revenue, reform under that cap, and look at the taxes that are good economic drivers for Minnesota. Let's not punish success. Um, and let's get stable sources of funding. When you have a very high progressive, in, highly progressive income tax rate, as Minnesota does, that high end tends to whip a lot when we go through um, normal economic cycles. And that creates a shortfall in revenue from what we project. So let's look at stability. Um, but I don't think we need more revenue. The private sector has given us enough. Senator Michelle Benson, thank you for coming in and, and talking about this bevy of uh, legislation. We just appreciate your perspective on many of these items. Thanks again. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. University of Minnesota President Eric Kaler finds himself responding to a Wall Street Journal report that the used administrative costs are inflated. I want to know specifically when you, uh, when you got sworn in or when you became president of the university, uh, how many administrators uh, were at the university? And then over the last 18 months, what have you done uh, in your leadership role as president to um, address some of those uh, administrative costs? And then uh, 18 months later, where are we today? First off, what is the cost of the people who deliver our mission? who are in the front lines of teaching, research, and service. So that's a faculty member, but it's an extension agent. It's a researcher running a, helping to run a clinical drug trial, uh, somebody bringing in external dollars. So those are the mission doers. Then the second category is a mission enabler. 
So those are people, for example, librarians. Now, to my own view, a librarian who is included as an administrator in iPads data is in fact a pretty important partner for students and faculty to do what they need to do. And in fact, you can make an argument that if you have the right number of librarians, uh, you do better than if you have too few. So that's an example where somebody classified as an administrator by this iPads data is in fact a pretty important enabler of what we do. <laughs> And the third category is the group that's providing executive <coughs> or, or administrative oversight management for the institution, people like me. And those three categories we've benchmarked and I think provide a very robust window and we will detail for you uh, this for you in, in committee, Senator, if you would, if you would like, uh, of what this university looks like. So I'm trying to get away from this administrator category and the associated feelings that, gee, they're not doing very much, but instead looking at what people do. What do you think uh, at this point with this institution that is so important to us, we need to uh, establish so that you can offer that in an ongoing basis so that we can help you do the work to increase the funding for tuition? The, the data given to the Wall Street Journal uh, was budget data that we don't use to manage personnel, but that he used to analyze personnel. And so that's just, uh, and, and if he had come back to us and said, look what I found, then we could have explained to him why that was a problem, because it, it, it's a clearly a problem to somebody who's working with that data. So a direct answer to your question is that we are working very hard to make the backroom functions of our organization as effective and efficient as they can be. As you heard earlier in the program, Senator Michelle Benson said she could be open to the idea of all-day state-funded kindergarten in certain situations. The author of that proposal is freshman Senator Greg Clausen. He sat down with us to talk about his legislation and his new career in public office. Senator Greg Clausen, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Senator, I want to begin with, this was your first attempt at statewide office. Why the Minnesota Senate? What, what precipitated your decision to run? Well, I've always been interested in public affairs. Uh, my background is in education. Um, I recently retired in 2008 uh, from being a high school principal, and I finally had time to kind of do a few things uh, that I've been thinking about my life, and, and I thought now was the time to uh, enter into politics. Well, many would decide to go fishing or go uh, do something more <laughs> recreational. What was it that really drew you to public office? You can still like public affairs, but that doesn't necessarily draw you to to running for office? You know, as an educator, I always viewed my life as a life of service. And so moving into the Senate is just a continuation of my life's work. Let's talk a little bit about your time in schools, you know, with what, more than four decades in the public school system. Yes. As you said, principal of Rosemount High School. What specific skills and issues do you bring to the Senate based on your prior life, your prior experiences? Well, a life spent in education, certainly. But beyond that, I think as an educator, uh, it's a people business, you know, so you're always working with people, you're trying to bring people together, uh, trying to formulate uh, problem solving. Uh, so I think that's a big, a big uh, skill set that I bring to the Senate. And uh, as I mentioned, just my background uh, in education and educational issues. And you were a principal during some kind of tumultuous times with public, uh, within the public school system. You know, we had No Child Left Behind. There were just a lot of different programs implemented statewide and federally. Did any of those come into your decision to run for office? Were there issues that you thought could be challenged or, or fixed, for lack of a better word, here within the state? I wouldn't say that any specific thing drove me, but we certainly had discussions with the testing system in Minnesota uh, amongst colleagues, um, system principals I worked with, and we would frequently talk about, uh, we think there's a better way. So, uh, you know, that certainly is one of the things that we'll be working on here in, in the Senate and the legislature. And as a former principal, what do you think is a better way? Well, I think you need to look at individual student growth over time uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, versus testing a group of students and comparing that group uh, to the previous group. Uh, so I think 
it's very important that you look at individual student growth and that student is always progressing. Let's talk a little bit about your bill for all day kindergarten state funded. Why did you choose this as your, I don't know if I want to say signature legislation, but your first piece of uh, definitely, first piece of legislation that drew a lot of media attention? Well, when I was campaigning, I always said that uh, education is really the infrastructure that drives the Minnesota economy, and I truly believe that. And I think uh, we need to start uh, with some of the statistics we've seen, uh, graduation rates, um, students leaving high school without the skills that employers need. I think that we need to take a look at uh, how we're preparing students. And uh, there's been a lot of studies that have been done about uh, all day kindergarten, all year kindergarten, and the importance of getting a, a good foundation uh, for later learning and academics and reading. And so I thought that was a good place to start. Can the state afford it? Well, that's to be seen. Um, Another thing I said while campaigning was that I think this legislative session is going to be all about priorities. And the things that are really important to us, the things that we value, that we need to understand that comes with a price. And we have to analyze those things and ask ourselves what's going to be best for the people of Minnesota, what's going to move Minnesota forward uh, in the years ahead. Uh, all day kindergarten is one of the things that I think is important. Senator, you're a freshman here in the Senate, and yet you're not moving at typical freshman pace. Why did you come out of the gate so strongly with legislation already? What, what precipitated your uh, decision to move forward quickly? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's, it's something that I've been thinking about. It's something that's important in talking with the leadership uh, in the Senate uh, and leadership uh, with colleagues in the House. Um, it was something that we felt uh, was important to get out there as a signature issue. Well, Senator Klassen, you've had a little bit of time to get into the swing of things here. What's your impression of the Senate overall? You know, I've always viewed myself as a lifelong learner, and the thing that I am uh, amazed at in some ways is the number of uh, learning opportunities, that, let's say. Uh, I'm learning about things that I've really not had a lot of contact with, um, and I enjoy that. Uh, learning about different industries, different issues, uh, getting a perspective. Um, so that's that's been very enjoyable. The schedule is uh, very hectic, uh, moving from one meeting to another, evening events, uh, making sure we're contacting constituents. So it's a very busy schedule. But. Any big surprises so far? Um, not really. Uh, you know, it's the first time, I, I guess I, I kind of take it by day, day by day. I haven't had a lot of um, previous expectations as you're going through the process. And uh, so it's uh, every day is a new challenge, a new adventure, a new opportunity. Okay, Senator Greg Clausen, thank you for your time today. I'm sure we'll get you back on the Capitol Report set soon to talk about some legislation. We appreciate it. Thank you. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. That wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thanks for watching.